telling you up front, this is the worst illustration I've ever had for you guys. All right, I'm not, sell, I'm not selling this at all. Uh, what are these, by the way? Pool noodles. Pool noodles, yeah. All right. Bam. right. All right, that's what they're for. Imagine, though, they are uh, swimmies instead, all right? Like I'm, a, like I'm a little guy and I don't know how to swim, so I've got the swimmies. How many of you had swimmies when you were kids? Come on, fess up. Yeah. How many of you had swimmies growing up as kids? There was no such thing when I was a kid. You just drowned. I mean, it was just, it was, it was just no, no fun at all. But um, so I have these swimmies. I'm jumping in. You know, I've got, we've got a three-year-old and a one-year-old in our, in our house and our family now. And uh, Leanne actually, if, if you see Leanne and she looks like she's about ready to fall asleep, it's because she is. We had the three-year-old and one-year-old this weekend while my daughter was away. And, uh, well, you, that's the reason you have kids when you're younger. We figured that out. But, uh, so if I'm swimming with these, I, I can't sink, right? That's the, that's the thought. And, I'm, you know, I, I jump in, I pop right back up, real cool, that kind of thing. What happens when I learn to swim? How many of you have learned to swim? All right. Not, all right. It took me a while to learn to swim. Uh, I remember taking lessons at the Y and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and... When I learned to swim, I no longer, did I need these anymore? No, I didn't need them anymore. There was no need for the swimmies. I wanted to jump in by myself. It's not very fun. Have you ever jumped in a pool on the deep end with swimmies and you're actually trying to That doesn't work at all. You bounce back up and that's just not fun. So when I learned to swim, I, I could go around without the swimmies and I was unsinkable at that point, all right? That's the thought here. I, without that, I was, I, I, when I learned, I was unsinkable. Tonight, we're going to learn about the resurrection. And we're going to learn about our resurrected bodies. And the opposite of what we're seeing here is we're going to see sin and death are, are connected. And when I have sin in my life, when I have not accepted Jesus Christ... And I'm, and I'm a sinner that's not saved, what happens to me? I'm going to die physically and spiritually. Death comes because of sin. But once my sin has been removed by Jesus Christ, guess what? I float. All right? I have no more death in my life either. When the sin is gone, so is the death. And... The Lord tells us in that time, at the end of this, this, what we're going to see tonight, we're supposed to be unmovable. We're supposed to have, we're supposed to be fruitful in our life, abounding in the Lord. Because we're like that swimmer now that's unsinkable. We are, we are abounding and we are unmovable for God because we know, we know that we are saved. And God's going to give us a resurrected body and we'll someday be with Him. And because of that fact, knowing we'll be with the Lord, we are supposed to be unmovable. So, that's our comparison tonight, All right, You guys can have a seat. Good job. Get my hand. Are these from Awana? Where's Jacob? Are they they intentionally uh, FC Cincinnati? Yes, all right, all right. Very good. That's cool. All right, open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15. No FC Cincinnati fans in here? That's, that's Cincinnati's newest team. Yeah, we've got to... They actually win. <laughs> we should root for them. 1 Corinthians 15. This time of year, we speak a lot about the resurrection... We're near Easter, right? He mentioned that this morning as well. Uh, We've been going through 1 Corinthians, specifically, we've been going through 1 Corinthians 15. This is our third week in this. And in that, we saw the significance of Christ's resurrection. It It was the only way salvation could be made to man. Now, him dying for us was of drastic importance. Sinless God died for us, but as was mentioned this morning, Salvation comes because of the resurrection as well, which we see again tonight. We saw the order of the resurrection as well, with first Jesus Christ being resurrected, and then the Christians. 
those when, uh, when we die and when the Lord returns, we will be resurrected as well. Last time, we looked at then why a resurrected body? Why do we have a resurrected body? It, we saw that it was essential and then what it would be what it would look like, what it, what, would, what it would be. Tonight, we finish up chapter 15, and we're going to look at the, the need for the resurrection. We're going to see the victory for the resurrection, and then we're going to see the outworking of the resurrection in our life today. So we find ourselves in 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So then this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask you now to open our hearts to uh, your word. Help us as we look at the resurrection that we'll see uh, the victory that we get from this and how you are to uh, use this in our life and in our daily basis. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, we see tonight as we look at these verses, first I want you to see the need for the resurrection. We're going to be in verses 50 through 53. And we're just going to step verse by verse through this tonight. Uh, these last verses, because they just tell the story. Verse 50, Paul tells us that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Our present condition, what you look at every day in the mirror, our present condition cannot be in God's kingdom. We need, as we shared last time, a resurrected body. What is that? Well, we'll talk about this a little bit more. And then he repeats the thought, and he says, in in another way, he rephrases rephrases it, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Our decaying, our mortal bodies are not suitable for God's kingdom. That's interesting. We need resurrected bodies. They're different bodies altogether. The body that we will have in, in our resurrection will be different completely. Bodies that are incorruptible. That's the significance. That's the important point here. They, they don't decay. They don't wear out. Amen? That's awesome. The age in eternity is not a thing. If you're 30 or if you're 80 or if you're 1,050 years old, it doesn't matter in eternity. It's just not, it's not a quantity that we would measure anymore. So we have this incorruptible body, and I'm looking forward to that. Then in verse 50, he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. Now, a mystery in the Bible isn't some mystic knowledge that must be unlocked with clues and, and mystic arts and things of that nature. We hear when the word mystery is used in the Bible, some people just get all up and, uh, and troubled and bothered about that kind of thing. No, 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 because he then tells us what that mystery is. Uh, a mystery in the Bible is something that mankind can't understand on their own. We don't come up with this on our own. It has to be revealed to us by God when He chooses to reveal it to us. So they were a mystery, this mystery that we're going to talk about, they did not know in the Old Testament. They did not know until the time that God reveals it to Paul here that we, sh- that we shall know it. So it's an understood spirit- spiritually as the Holy Spirit uses His Word to reveal it to us. It's simply that. There's nothing beyond that. The mystery is, he tells us in 51, what is this? It says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That's the mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. God has revealed through the Apostle Paul that there will be a, 
I'm going to call it a final generation. There will be a final generation. By that I mean a generation that will be given resurrected bodies before their death. Why? Because Christ has returned. Christ has returned in, in the rapture and this group of people, this final generation, it might be this generation, we don't know. Paul thought it probably was his generation. But there's going to be this final generation. They will not sleep, but they will be given their resurrected body prior to that. Now, sleep in, the, in this term is a, is a term Paul uses to describe uh, the Christian after death. Uh, the soul is with the Lord, but the body is awaiting resurrection. And so they call that sleep. Uh, did Paul think it would occur in his generation? I, I think he probably did. It, possibly. He, he definitely thought it would be soon. And as you read Peter, Peter thought it was going to probably happen in his lifetime as well. And both the men lived with expectation and urgency. That's the key there. They lived with an expectation that, and an urgency that God could return at any time. And that's really a biblical way to live, is it not? We don't know when the Lord's going to return. Those friends, family, work, co-workers, that we, it's now that we need to reach them for Jesus Christ because we don't know. How I live my life on a daily basis. I don't wait and wait and wait to repent of something. No, I keep my record short. I don't know when the Lord's going to return. And we see here this urgency, this biblical way, because none of us know. So let's keep looking at this mystery. We won't all sleep, but we'll, but we'll all be changed. And then it, when's this going to happen? Well, verse 52. It's going to happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Now, what are those timings? The timing here is quick, an unknown. That's the key here. Quick and unknown. When it's time, there will be no time to prepare. When this moment occurs, when this twinkling of the eye occurs, there will be no more time to prepare. Whatever decisions for Christ must be made before or you will be there for the tribulation after the Lord has removed those that are Christians. There's no more time after that. It's been made. So the time is now as you have the time to make a decision for the Lord. Then he gives us the order. For the trumpet shall sound, and what happens? And the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we, those are those that are alive that he's speaking to, shall be changed. Now Paul says the, almost the exact same thing uh, in, in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15 and 18, if you want to turn there. He says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet, the trump of God. And what happens? And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So the same order. The dead in Christ will be raised first. They will receive their incorruptible bodies. Then we which are alive and remain, this last generation, whoever, whatever time frame that is, they will receive their resurrected body as well. Why it's this order? I don't know. But this is the order that God has chosen. So the dead in Christ will first receive their resurrected body, and then those Christians which are alive. The dead have their souls already with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5.8 tells us, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So we know once we pass away that our spirit will be with the Lord. But our body is buried. And 1 Thessalonians tells us that we shall be caught up together in the clouds. This is the term we, we call the rapture. Caught up is what this means. And this is that time. This is the resurrection. This occurs at the last trump. Now what's that? Well, 
Our post-tribulation friends uh, think this is at or after the last judgment of the tribulation found in uh, Revelation chapter 11. Uh, That is a trump of an angel that plays that. Um, Not necessarily the trumpet of God mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 4. In fact, I think it is not that trumpet. Rather, the last trump here falls in line with a figure of speech that the Roman military used to use. When the military, uh, when they were ready to move, you don't go around this large army and tell them uh, that, hey, let's pick up, it's time to go, it's time to go. No, you use a trumpet. And the Roman military would use a trumpet and they would use three trumps. The first trump was basically tear down the, tear down the tents and get ready to go. The second trump would be get lined up. And then the third trump, the last trump, would be the order to, let's move out. Marching orders. We're heading out. It's time to leave. Is that not what this is? It's the last trump. It's time for us to leave. It's time for us to head out. We're going to be with the Lord. We're going to be with Him forever, it tells us there at the end of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So when the trumpet blows, it is our time to leave this earth because now on the earth after that, the Lord's judgment is going to come to full fruition. And it is preparing for what eventually will be His millennial reign, His thousand-year reign here on earth. So the last trump He's talking about is the removal of those, the church, those that are Christians. They're going to be with the Lord forever. So verse 53, He restates verse 50 now after sharing this about the resurrection, this explanation. The needs for for resurrection. He says corruption must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. See that phrase? Must put on. There is no other way to enter eternity with the Lord without putting that on. Well, how do I do that? Well, we don't do anything. That's the wonderful part about it. The Lord has done that for us. And by paying for our sin, the penalty for our sin, He is the one that gives us incorruption. He is the one that gives us immortality. We didn't deserve it. We don't know how to do it. But God has done that for us. Amen to that. So we see the need for the, the, need for the resurrection. Next we see from that the victory of the resurrection. There is a victory that comes with that. This, this last point and, uh, and this one that should build our faith and just should give us joy and make us feel loved and give us purpose. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in, in a few minutes. But verse 54, when the last trump occurs, the moment happens, and he says, so when this corruptible shall have incorruption. So we must put this on, and now he's saying, so when this corruptible, so when this happens, When this shall have incorruption, and this mortal dying body shall put on immortality, then death is swallowed up in victory. That is the fulfillment of prophecy by Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8. Hundreds and hundreds of years before that. And now we see it fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Our resurrected body isn't just restored. It isn't a new you. We will be a completely new form of life. I don't have the words to express that. It's just completely different. Death is defeated and Christ has the victory. So Paul goes on. And now he quotes Hosea 13, 14. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Man, that makes great music, doesn't it? Some of the best songs ever when you you get to hear that. Death, where is thy sting? Oh, it's just good stuff. Now, yes, we're going to, if, if we're not in that last generation, we are going to physically die someday if it's prior to this last trump. But in Christ, the sting of that death, it's gone. Our physical death is not final. Think of that. It's not final. But, for those that have rejected Jesus Christ, for those that might be you and you've not dealt with your sin, 
death still has its sting. What do I mean by that? Because when death comes and you haven't dealt with your sin, it seals it. It seals your decision for eternity. The grave will have victory over you because it is in this life only that we can accept the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. Without taking God's way of escape, you are sealed to await the judgment of God for your sin. It has to be done now. But this is not so for the redeemed. This is not so for those of us that have accepted Christ. And we're nothing special, right? I'm, nothing, I'm no different than you are. I had an opportunity to and see, see what Jesus Christ did for me, and I accepted that gift of salvation. I believe that Jesus Christ died and was buried and rose again in my place. He took my sin upon Him, and I believe that. And the Christian's physical death, my physical death, leaves the body in the grave while we await Christ's return, and we are spiritually with Him. The sting of death, he tells us in verse 56. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. This is what I was trying to tell the kids. The sting of death, sin, is defeated. Therefore, the result of sin, death, is defeated. We get that? When sin is defeated, death is defeated. When sin is defeated, death is defeated. And through Jesus Christ, the wages of sin, death, has been paid. And we aren't held under that penalty. Amen? And he tells us, verse 57, the exact same thing you just said in your amen. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Words are important, are they not? Through. The victory is through the, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We have victory, which means those that who... We have victory because of Jesus Christ, so that means those who reject Christ, what do they have? What's the opposite of victory? Defeat. Death. And judgment. Please, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, get that straightened today. Accept Christ to have that victory in your life. Because we have the victory of the resurrection. And then verse 58, as we come to the end of this chapter, it's, he tells us here the outworking of what this is going to be. What's this cause? Now it's only one verse, but it really says it all. Because of all that Paul has just told us, uh, about, uh, about the significance of the resurrection for our eternal life and how it's going to work out. It should, be ma- it should manifest a reaction in us. It should manifest a, a mindset uh, in us right now. Today. Tomorrow. The next day. It should motivate us. Verse 58. Therefore. Therefore. Because of everything I just said, he's what he's saying there. Because of everything I've just shared with you, he, and, and, and he, he reads this, and then he says, be ye, and he starts going into this list. Uh, great pastor uh, down in First Baptist, Jacksonville, Jerry Vines, uh, he, he uses the three words for these. Firmness, faithfulness, and fruitfulness. I love that. That's really good. Firmness. He says, be ye steadfast, unmovable. Because of all this I know, about what Christ has done, the victory He's given us, and, and the resurrected body that we, we know we're going to have someday, and how He has saved us, be steadfast and unmovable. Knowing that we know our future with the Lord, we should be steadfast, unmovable, meaning fixed. Fixed in our purpose. Fixed in our position. There is no need to compromise the Word of God. We can be steadfast and unmovable. The Lord doesn't change. He is immutable. He does not change. What He has told us does not change. I don't care what happens in our society and how we can redefine words to mean whatever they want them to mean. The Lord does not change. 
And we do not change based on the society around us. We might change a method and how we, we speak it to someone, but the Word of God does not change, and we need to be steadfast. I, we've been, uh, this week I've been reading several things. Uh, we might have mentioned this in the podcast this week, the, the word hold fast. As you study that through, that's, you know, that's the action of being steadfast, right? Hold fast to the Word of God. Hold fast to what He has for us. There is a confidence in knowing you are loved and accepted. You are His child. Uh, I've used this example before, but I, I can't think of a better example. When uh, I love to watch a, a young bride who maybe was a, a, a young lady that dealt with uh, some self-confidence issues. And you see them married to a, to a young man that treats, the, treats her properly and respects her, and you start to see confidence. They become almost a different person because they're, they're, there's some steadfastness there because they know their relationship is secure. Now take that to the, to the nth degree. Your relationship with the Lord, no one can pluck you out of the hand of God. You can be unmovable. You can be steadfast. Isn't that awesome? We know who we are. We are secure in that. And from that, he tells us then faithfulness, abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing what we know of the future. We should see an urgency for this life. Don't waste your teen years saying, I'll do this when I get in college or I'll do this when I get out of college. No, we start now. Why waste these years? You only get so many years in life. Why, why waste some so you can do it later? Let's spend our whole life. If you don't live your life, no one else is going to live it. The same for us. It doesn't matter if we're a teenager or if we're 85 years old. Use our lives for the Lord. Abounding, abounding in the work of the Lord. Spend your life on the Lord. It is worth it. We should be people of the Word, but it should cause us to be people of activity. It should cause us to be people of joy. Now let me make this distinction here. It is in the Lord, the word, excuse me, the Lord working in us and through us. There is a difference between the Lord working in us and through us or working for the Lord. When I'm just working for the Lord, doing what I think He wants, do, no, no, no. Let me allow the Lord to work in me and through me. And abounding in the work of the Lord requires then me yielding to Him, allowing Him to guide me who I'm going to speak to, where I'm going to serve, those types of things. And consider yourself an instrument in the hand of the Lord. Wow, what a greater purpose that we could have. Allowing ourselves to be that instrument in His hand for His glory. Not, look what I did for the Lord, pat, pat, pat. Versus, I'm going to serve the Lord. How are you going to use me, Lord? and allowing Him to do that, and abounding in the work of the Lord. And it produces fruitfulness. Labor is not in vain in the Lord, He tells us there. Isn't that awesome? You might have been serving in some ministry and nobody's, you think no one sees it. You might be doing something that, that's in your neighborhood or at your workplace or whatever it is, and you just think no one, no one sees this. They might not. But the Lord does. And He promises that our labor is not in vain. I need to know that some days. I know you do as well. Our labor is not in vain. He sees us. He guides us. And serving the Lord has meaning. I have often pondered. You hear, uh, I get no less than five emails a week from different missionaries. Sometimes if it gets near graduation time, you're a lot more. Brother Kirk, were you this way as well? You got a lot of emails from missionaries that would want you to come, want to come in and, and give their, uh, you know, their, their sermon and their whole thing on where, where they're going to be. And 
you have to be selective. I mean, we just can't have, we'd have someone here every week. And um, I've often looked, you see, they're going to a group of people that's a tribe. And you're in your flesh, and you're thinking, and you're, I'm, is this, this group of 100 to 1,000 people that he's going to, this guy's going to spend 15, 20 years of his life? Is that, uh, is that a good use of, of your life? And then my heart gets convicted. Well, you're you're in, a, in a, just a, an area of Cincinnati. Is that any different than an area in the middle of wherever? No, it's not. Those are souls. These are souls. All of them need Christ. And God is going to use them. And that man's efforts are not going to be in vain. He has to know that in his heart. He has to believe that and with all his heart. Just as much as you and I serving right here at Friendship Baptist Church or wherever God may take us in our lifetime, where we're serving, do we believe that it is not in vain what we're doing? If you believe that it is not in vain what you're doing, it should have some energy. It should have some zeal. That it is worth doing. Our labor is not in vain in the Lord. We must realize our lives have results. They have eternal consequences. Eternal consequences. Do you look at your ministry that way? Those you're speaking with, you're ministering to, it has eternal consequences. That is not in vain. As a child of God, we have Christ's power in our life, and that will cause a reaction in our society. We allow ourselves to be steadfast, unmovable, abounding. From our nursery to our senior adults, from our neighbor to our coach, from our witness to our helpers, to those being a helper, what you're doing for the Lord is not in vain. Christ wants to work in you and through you. Are we allowing Him to? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we've taken this look at the resurrection, we see the victory that You give us through this. Dear Heavenly Father, there might be some here today that don't have victory because they've never dealt with their sin. They've never dealt with the realization that they're a sinner separated from You, that You love them and sent Christ to die for them. I ask You, dear Heavenly Father, to draw them to You that they would accept Christ today. Be with us as this church, this body of believers, that we would see what we're doing for You is not in vain. It would make us unmovable. It would make us steadfast and abounding like You would have us to do. Be with us now. Be with our hearts and help us to seek You. In Jesus' name, Amen.